Okay. Hello. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. I am here today with uh, Jilly Barmer. Jilly Barmer is an expert in recruitment, um, and in particular in the nonprofit sector. And what I wanted to talk to her today about is recruitment of fundraisers and what we're going through at the moment. Jilly, how are you? Hi, I'm very well, Simon. How are you? I'm amazing. Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, who are you? Why, why are you here and why are you such an expert? Why am I such an expert? Okay, well, I suppose I've been recruiting for the charity and nonprofit sector for the last, oh, nigh on 17 years, but more specifically for charity and nonprofit in the last 10 years, um, general recruitment before that. So, almost 17, 18 years in total. Um, I love working with the charity nonprofit sector. So um, that's an area that I've really honed in on over the last 10 years or so. Um, and yeah, that's it's me specifically. I work with um, generally senior level executive and CEO positions um, and sometimes some management positions as well to go along with that. So you, I mean, you're in it a long time. So you've obviously seen ups and downs in Ireland. Um, you've seen the Celtic Tiger. You've seen the bust, and you've seen the recovery now. What yeah. are what are what are we going through at the moment in terms of recruitment or fundraisers? Are people struggling? I I feel like they're struggling just anecdotally. But how are you finding it? Yeah, I mean, I think really good fundraisers are really really very difficult to find. Um, you know, you've got plenty of people working within the sector itself. Um, but it's sometimes like finding a needle in a haystack, um, to be perfectly honest. So you'll find that a lot of people may apply for a job um, and you know it's, it's really about drilling down into those applications and finding really the best uh, candidates that are there on the market and looking at various different ways of investigating as to how they are the best candidates uh, and not just taking it as, as read. Yeah, the applicants you see, are they, is it a mix between private sector and people who are already in fundraising or where do they come from? Yeah, they do. Um, generally speaking, the majority would come from um, charity sector and non-profit sector um, because I suppose any of the people that I would approach specifically would come from, you know, not competitor, but similar organizations to those that um, are, are looking from a cultural perspective um and from an organizational maybe size things like that so i've set out criteria um to find those types of particular people um but yes i do interview people from the private sector as well and um, so yeah it's kind of a, a bit of a full circle so why do you think fun fundraising is a, a difficult or, or or there aren't many qualified people in it is there just um I mean, why aren't people coming into this? Why aren't people trained up in it? Why isn't their experience there? Okay. I think to start off with, um, good fundraisers tend to be very committed to their cause. Um, so if they're very committed to their cause, they don't tend to leave um, that organization or that cause very easily. Um, they become tied in and, you know, um, very vocationally involved. Um, I think good fundraisers are akin to good salespeople. And I suppose, you know, um, good salespeople aren't necessarily, you know, made, they're born. So it, it, it's a difficult one. Um, I think that, you know, good fundraisers, you need to be able to understand relationships and building trust within relationships. And I think that that can be very difficult in this time to find people like that where, you know, we're living in an age that is very specifically orientated and connected with and concerned with social media um, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, the old, old school style of relationship building. So, it, you know, it, it's difficult to find people who have that old school mentality um, and are in it to, to develop relationships and develop trust. You, me you mentioned that people are like... Um... I suppose loyal, almost loyal to where they're working, or dedicated to where they're working. You, you obviously reach out and headhunt sometimes. Do you find people just aren't willing to move because they don't want to, they don't want to step away from what they're, what they're committed to? Yeah, I do. To be honest with you, I mean, there are always passive candidates on the market, and um, so when I'm looking specifically, um, it's very much, I suppose, going about it with a very gentle touch to see if people are are looking to move. Um, or have been thinking about it for, for some time. And it's generally those people who have been maybe thinking about it for six to 12 months, even even two years, up to two years, 
um, before they decide, yeah, okay, it's time for me to move. One of the main reasons I'd say that people do look to move on from their current position is for it's for personal reasons rather than generally what I find it's not really organizational um, reasons that they're looking to move on it's more maybe that they need to develop themselves further they need a new challenge and bring their career maybe to the next level or perhaps they have a specific set of skills in fundraising and you know they may or may not cross over with another area and they'd like to develop skills in that other area or build up their skills to make a more kind of a rounded um, um, skill set within fundraising so so do you think like nonprofits are missing a trick there in terms of retaining staff so if, if staff are leaving because they feel like they're um, uh, not being developed or they're not getting you know being being able to go to that next level is that something that that employers in the nonprofit sector should we should be be trying to nurture these people and give them the training and invest in them so that they'll want to stay? I think yeah, that's one of the key things in in the charity sector. I mean, we don't, you know, charities aren't in a position to be able to offer the types of benefits um, that maybe you know private sector companies can offer their employees. So it's really really important to to be able to sort of um, encourage their staff and to retain staff by giving extra benefits that that maybe aren't um financially um oriented um so things like you know training days days to conferences um upskilling in whatever area but also i think it's really important that employers listen clearly to employee feedback and you know um employees get a chance to say and to state what areas that they feel maybe they're they're they could you know, benefit from upscaling in, um, and to to provide that training or to send them out on training courses where necessary. You know, yeah, so, sure, yeah, that, that makes sense. I think that's a big area. Yeah. So, in terms of um, stepping back from the retention bit, in terms of actual recruitment, I, I obviously deal with a lot of organisations who, you know, small and medium ones who don't really know where to start in recruiting, or they've recruited a fundraiser and have. Um, you know, haven't had much luck or it hasn't worked out or they're not getting the applicants. Where, where on a practical level, where do we start with recruitment? Obviously, talk to you because you're the best. But besides that, you know, how, if I was the CEO of a small organization, where should I be advertising? Who should I be talking to? Okay, well, I think first and foremost, you know, the charity needs to sit down and decide on what exactly that they are looking for that seems to be one of the the challenges um is that it's it's you know sometimes the job description itself isn't clear people put out there that you know they want this type of person but they don't actually maybe advertise the role specifically and bullet point the role so i think in order to to find the right person you need to, a, a starting point of knowing exactly what you're looking for. I think charities need to be very, very patient and be willing to go through a thorough recruitment process and not just expect to get CVs in overnight and over rely on CVs from advertising. That's the biggest mistake I come across um, is that organizations are looking for a quick fix because someone's leaving and they need to get someone in fast because they need funds in fast. It's not the answer. The answer is to um, I suppose engage in a very thorough recruitment process and that means research it means time dedication to researching candidates and it means approaching candidates like I would say that 80% of the candidates that I find for clients are through search they're approached candidates they're not coming through advertising so I think that you know a lot of charities do rely on one method of securing candidates for their positions, and that tends to be advertising. Um, so time and energy needs to go into the actual research and finding the person to start with, that's to begin with. The organization needs to be very patient. Um, like I said before, it's not gonna happen overnight, but the more work and effort that goes into finding the person, the better the outcome for the organization, the better the match, the employee is going to be the right fit for the organization and therefore stay longer and be more loyal to that organization. Um, so they really need to commit to the process. They need to have their branding and their goals and their strategy all very, very clearly set out. They need to have the role specifically very well broken down 
um, and not just put out there what the person spec is. It's about the job as well and what the job entails. They also need to advertise the job in terms of how um, people might be attracted to it, but also make it real. You know, so there's no use selling a job that's not a real job. So you need to put it out there as it actually is, but also, you know, enhance the attraction, uh, the attractive aspects of the role as well. So be really clear, give a lot of information and be focused, um, patient and targeted in their approach. That, that makes a lot of sense when you say it, and it, it also seems like the opposite of what a lot of places are doing. Uh, it's kind of that vague net that's thrown out. Um, yeah. But I'm really interested in what you're saying about approaching potential people, because I hadn't really thought of that. You're saying the majority of your applicants come through that. What's the, this is yeah. this is a curveball for you, but what are the, what's the ethics of that? What's the ethics if I'm a CEO, a nonprofit, approaching fundraisers who I think are doing a good job and would fit in my organization? Okay, so generally speaking, charity um, CEOs don't go after uh, candidates by approach, um, unless it's somebody that they know within their network and that they, you know, may be able to pick up the phone to and, and have a chat. Generally speaking, they would employ somebody like me to do that for them. So I would then be the intermediary person. It, 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 it's not really seen as very ethical, to be honest with you, to uh, pick up the phone as a CEO and go after staff in another charity organization. It, it wouldn't be seen in a good light. Um, however, I do have a role to play, and obviously that would be my position. So I would tent tentatively um, approach my network and then their network. Um, and in that in that way, I suppose it's a more soft, uh, more professional soft approach rather than, you know, um, a hard cold hold to somebody that maybe not be interested and wouldn't look good from the charity's perspective. Like, mm. for example, one of my most recent um, positions, I would have approached 60 or 70 candidates, which may seem like a lot, but that would be, you know, that would be quite typical of um, a recruitment process and probably received about 40, maximum 50 um, jobs through advertising, so. Wow, okay, yeah. So it's it's much more shifted on you actually doing not doing the work, but actually seeking out yourself. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you quickly about is you, you spend a bit of time on LinkedIn, like like me. I, you know, it's obviously a very important tool in, in both of our roles. One of the things that I find really funny is people um, advertising on LinkedIn about their induction process. So that yes. like they're on onboarding and things like that. And you often see those photos on LinkedIn of someone with like an iPhone and a laptop and car keys. It's like, oh, here's my onboarding. And it's such a great company to work for. Yeah. Obviously, obviously we can't do a nonprofit sector, or maybe we can, but but how, how important is that kind of induction or those first few uh, weeks and months when a person comes into my organization and starts working for me? I think to be honest with you, it's the same for any organization. It is hugely important. Um, I think from the very outset, in order to um, ensure that that person is, is going to be happy, you need to be very clear, as I've said a number of times, on the job description and right through the interview process, be very, very clear with the candidate in terms of what the expectations are and the goals and the KPIs that are set out. From there, when the person joins the organization, I think it's really important to re-emphasize those goals and KPIs and also have them stated in their job description if there's any particular goals or KPIs, especially if they're individual targets as opposed to team targets uh, when it comes to fundraising. Um, again, very important to have regular one-to-one -one meetings with that person and to listen to their feedback um, because it might be a brand new position um, or it may be a position that this person is filling and if they're listened to, um, you know, it can overcome obstacles that may become bigger and snowball if they're not listened to initially and that could be cause for somebody to leave early on um, where it may not ne be necessary. I think also, you know, it's, it's very important to identify any needs for training and to, to really promote that within the organization at the early stages. So. That's good, that makes a lot of sense. All right, I'm not gonna keep you much longer. The other thing, the last thing I want to ask you is just a little bit about interviewing because we've talked about this before, yes. job interviewing. Yes. And I'm curious uh, if you have any tips for people when they're interviewing a fundraiser, because very often it's someone who has no fundraising experience, yeah. um, asking someone who who claims to be a great fundraiser, 
So yeah. how do we how do we break that down and, and do a good interview? Okay. Well, I think first and foremost, again, preparation. Look at the types of questions that you want to ask this person specifically um, in relation to the job that's at hand. So really have your questions well prepared. Um, I would always use a scoring system in addition to my questions because it helps me to, um, I suppose, if five or six candidates are coming out on top, it helps me to differentiate those candidates into different areas. So that would be one thing that I would definitely recommend. I would say one of the things that I think um, interviewers can fall down on sometimes is that they tend to rely on you know, telling the candidate about the job and talking about the organization and really focus on selling the organization. And actually they come out of the interview realizing that they didn't really get to know that candidate very well. So it's important to let the person speak and, you know, make them feel comfortable because then you will find out a lot more about that person and you come away feeling a greater sense of, of what that person's about. Why are they you know, interested in, in that particular role. So I think it's really important to let the interviewee do as much talking as possible, obviously within reason. Um, I think key uh, to interviewing is if you are in doubt, remain in doubt. So I would just stick with that. <laughs> that's that, one of that's the a good, that's a good motto for life. life. Yeah. Another thing when it comes to fundraisers, I would look at discussing fundraisers' achievements. So you're looking at, like I said earlier, a breakdown of what their maybe team target was, but not only that, what was their individual target within that organization? Did they achieve the target that they were set in initially? Um, was, did the target um, increase year on year? Um, how did they achieve it? And then follow that up with, um, checks to make sure that what that person is saying is actually correct and true. Um, really thorough reference checking is, is really, really important as well. So I would recommend two to three references being checked. Generally speaking, I would check probably two references uh, pre-final interview for senior executive CEO level um, positions. Um, and then I suppose just a, a thorough uh, process so you know when it comes to interviewing you can't just expect to interview people uh, once and then you know there you have it found found the super perfect person it's important to measure consistency and it's important to I suppose um, get to know the person over time a little bit more than that as well so I would recommend two if not three interviews and for a final stage interview for more senior level positions, I would always recommend that the employer does um, asks the interviewee to prepare a presentation, a prepa and not for the sake of presenting, but to prepare a presentation around maybe their strategy within the role that they're going to be taking up or their ideas that they would implement within their organization. So it will give the employer a much clearer understanding of you know, how innovative is this person? Are they thinking clearly in line with our strategy, et cetera? So they will be yeah. mine. That makes a lot of sense. The, the last thing I, I wanted to uh, uh, talk to you about just really quickly, you said something like when we spoke before, because I was saying I hate when people interview in hotel lobbies and you were saying sometimes it's appropriate, but you were talking about the difference between you've done interviews in, in an office, in your home, in hotels, in public places. What, what, just out of curiosity, what is the difference you see in those kind of different kind of interview spaces? Yeah, very good question, actually. Um, I think that people, um, when they come into your home, they sort of, there's this kind of element of surprise and they kind of relax. They relax a lot because it's a living room space. It's not a desk with, you know, one person sitting here and the other person sitting there and very formal. So they tend to relax a lot and you, I think they see you more as a, as a, as a comrade um, and they, they tend to open up a lot more. That's my experience and, and I know that interviewing in a living room situation, I have got an awful lot more out of people in that context. Now, having said that, um, it's about you as an interviewer as well and how comfortable that you make that employee or that interviewee feel in the interview situation. So, you know, you, you need to be, you need to be warm, you need to be open, um, not necessarily make it fluffy bunny, 
but um, certainly you need to need to make that pe person feel comfortable enough to be themselves and um, come forward easily with their answers. So yeah, um, ho hotel lobby, uh, not ideal to be honest with you. Um, from the point of view, it, it's not comfortable for candidates because they can they, they know that people could be listening in and they could bump into their boss walking into the hotel reception, stuff like that. So I, I wouldn't really recommend it. I think either a private office or um, or a living room situation, um, as I've done in the past, works best. Cool. Very good. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for that. I'd love to have you back some time to talk about um, people job seeking, fundraisers job seeking, and how they can get the best for themselves. But I think that was that was really cool to. Um, if you'll come back, that was really cool to hear about it from the point of view from the organisation. Uh, is there anything you want to plug in terms of if people are looking to hire senior level fundraisers, then they should get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if, if, if any charity or non-profit sector uh, organization or religious um, order is looking to recruit, um, or also um, hospital foundation or third uh, level education university foundation is looking to recruit, um, those are the real key areas that I have experience in. So yeah, I'd love to hear from you. and. Um, you can contact me on my website, so that's um, www.barmerrecruitment.ie or on my mobile, which is on my website as well. Very good. And you're on LinkedIn as well, aren't you? you I'm you're, on LinkedIn, you're a big LinkedIn and, uh, Facebook page as well. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Okay. Barmerrecruitment.com. Thank you so much for that, Julie. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you for having me, Simon. Good to see you. Yeah.